الحق سلاحي وأقاوم أنا فوق جراحي سأقاوم أنا لم أستسلم لم أربق وعليك بلادي لأساوم الحق سلاحي وأقاوم أنا فوق جراحي سأقاوم أنا لم أستسلم لم أربق وعليك بلادي لأساوم بيد هنا أرض هنا بحر السهر النهر لنا وكيف بوجه And I would say, you know, from say 1946 uh, in Palestine, when um, there were lots of troubles, when the Jewish militias um, in, in Jerusalem were violent and um, were bombing places and shooting people uh, and, and went on getting worse and worse until 1948, which is when we left. Before that period, I had been a normal child in a normal family, really, in a nice little house uh, in Jerusalem, doing all the sorts of things that children do. But from 1946, when it really when it got to me that it had changed, until I settled into English society, I would say that that period of disruption, of horror, of trauma, is something I will never ever forgive the Zionists for, nor will I ever forgive the people who support Israel for supporting a movement that became a state which did that to innocent people. And I feel that viscerally, I really do. And of course it uh, motivated me in later life when I grew up to become an activist for Palestine, which is what I have been ever since. My name is uh, Rada Karmi. Uh, I come from Palestine, born in Jerusalem, um, and have ended up in, in England and in, in London in particular, um, not through any choice of mine, but because I lost my homeland and I don't have uh, my house anymore, my city anymore. Um, so, uh, so there we are. That's why I'm in, in, in Britain and I grew up here and got educated and, you know, that's where I live. Uh, because of the situation where the Palestinians lost their homes and their country to another people, it's very important to understand, to another people who took our place. That's the key here. It's because of that I've had to look on England, particularly London, as my home. Um, and very often I feel I belong here in, um, I suppose, in, a, in a, an emotional sense, although rationally I know I don't belong here. Uh, so there's the feeling of the question of belonging, but there's also uh, a, a, a tremendous a sense of loss, not in the traditional sense, not in the sense that I can recall losing this or that particular aspect of Palestine, but actually in the sense of losing um, a context, um, a definition of who I really am. Uh, so, in a sense, I have, and this is very corny because there have been so much written about or talked about in terms of other immigrants and refugees about their feelings for their homeland, but it's nevertheless perfectly valid and perfectly true that um, I have a, a loss, a sense of loss of a society of um, feeling myself to be part of Arab society. I'm not really, I'm not. And at the same time, I'm not part of 
English society. N no, not really. Though I'm, I fit in uh, here. I'm, I, I, um, I know how to relate. I know how to talk, so that I can be defined as somebody who is a Londoner. Um, it's not the same, and I'm very conscious of it every time I sit with a group of other Palestinians who do not have my same experience. They work together, if I can put it like that. They, they relate to each other um, in a way I can't really do it myself. Uh, I look the part, I sound the part because I speak Arabic, because I look uh, like them but really I'm not like them. It's a very curious place to be. I suppose another way to put it would be to say that I am straddling two cultures but fitting in neither really and um, it's a very strange feeling you know one has. It's very difficult to explain to somebody who doesn't have that experience um, and, and at the same time, I can't deny that it is a form of enrichment. It's not all negative. You know, I'm enriched by the second dimension, the, the, the dimension of being an Arab, uh, a Muslim, with a very specific legacy in history, um, and an outlook. And that enriches the other dimension, which is being English, understanding the English way of life, uh, understanding English culture, it is enriched by it. There's no, no doubt. I came to this country because we could no longer stay in ours um, after 1948. Now, what do I really remember before I was a child? Um, I would, you know, remember, I would remember more if it were not for a very curious fact, which has bothered me for a long time, until I think I've begun to understand it, I have very few memories of life um, before 1948 in Jerusalem, which is where we lived. I have some, but not as many as I think I could have had. And th the, the reason that this has happened has eluded me for a long time. I know many other people whose memories start even as young as three. That's not so in my case, not at all. And memories when I was older have vanished completely. For example, um, there was a village woman called Fatima who used to help my mother out in the house and looked after us, and particularly me, because I was the youngest. I loved this Fatima very, very much. <clears throat> Fatima symbolized that childhood, um, and yet, would you believe, I don't remember how she looked. I don't remember except as a kind of phantom presence. Uh, now, why is that? This person was terribly important to me. Um, I have some memories of my mother. They're not very good either. My father, <clears throat> um, which are better. But Fatima, not at all. Now, when I went to live in Ramallah many, many years later, in 2005, I was determined to find Fatima. I wanted to know what had happened to her. As much because I wanted to relive that early memory as, of course, because I was curious to know what happened after the cataclysm of 1948. Uh, now, I eventually found out what had happened and um, as part of that, because I found her grandson, and I talked to him and he filled in the gaps. But as part of that, he gave me a photograph of her and her brother. Her, her brother was called Muhammad and Muhammad was a sort of gardener, DIY man, who also helped us out. I stared and I stared, I remember, at the photograph thinking, does this evoke a memory? Can I see her moving? I couldn't. Now it's very odd that, um, and I think I, I think I know why. I think that the trauma 
1948 was so massive for a child that I blotted out all that came before. But that wipeout of memory before 1948 gives anybody listening to this an idea of how huge that trauma was, the enormity of it um, for everybody, let alone uh, a young child. As a result of that wipe out of memory, um, in a way, life began in um, London Airport, as it was called in those days. It wasn't called Heathrow in 1949, which is when we came to London. Born again <laughs> in, in an alien land. And what can I say about the contrast between uh, a northern country cold and grey and forbidding as I felt it was, um, the contrast with the warm society and country that I had been born into. I didn't have time to catch up uh, with, the, with the past and, and I, I, I'll explain what I mean. I had no a space in which to take in what had happened really that we'd got onto a plane and the plane arrived in, an, in, a, in a new country and what we'd left behind and all the rest of it couldn't do that because I had to survive in the new environment. I felt that so keenly when my parents obviously as soon as they could put me into a school and the school was nearby, but of course everybody spoke English. I didn't understand a word. Uh, and I had this desperate need to stand on my own two feet, to catch up with the girls, to be one of them. And it was so all-consuming. There was no space in my head to sit and think, oh gosh, what did I leave behind? What is this new place? How am I going to manage? What about the past? What about the memories? No space for that. Um, it took me a year to learn English, enough to be able to fit in um, and all the time it was a time of anxiety and fear and alarm because I had to walk to school, I walked back from school and everything I saw was fresh, was new and was alien, frankly, and foreign. Um, so uh, it took a year. But then I began, obviously, as a child. I, I fitted in and um, uh, started to feel a little bit more comfortable. Uh, but it, it, these were very tough years. The irony was that uh, we came from Jerusalem, where we were surrounded by Jews. And we turned up in, in the house my, my father had, had arranged for us. In all places, in, in, in all places in the world, um, Gold is Green. Um, Gold is Green is a very Jewish area in North London um, and particularly in the aftermath of the Second World War where many German Jewish refugees ended up. And, 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 and we lived there too. And I, well, how the hell did that happen? So I grew up in Gold is Green, very Jewish area. I went to a school uh, where more than half the girls in my class were Jewish and um, it was um, quite an experience. <laughs> my father had a, a view uh, which he imparted to us, I think, uh, a view which said that it wasn't so much the fault of the Jews that we ended up uh, where we were, refugees, etc., but rather the fault of the British. He was always very clear about that. And I remember him telling me this little anecdote. Um, I said to him, you know, once I realized what Golden Scream was, I said to him, but why, if we've had to leave our country because of Jews, why have we ended up living amongst Jews? And I remember him saying, uh, but you know, 
it's not the Jews that we have, we should have the problem with, it's the British. He said, if you have a house and you value, well, you have a house, it's your home, and you go to bed at night opening all the doors, opening all the windows, and thieves come in in the night and rob you, whose fault is it? Is it really the thieves' fault or is it yours for leaving all the doors and the windows unlocked? And that was obviously the, the analogy he used for what the British had done to us. They'd let in these people and these people behaved as they were going to behave, which they hadn't, was not a secret. They wanted to take the country over. Okay, but you don't let them in. If you let them in, that's what they're going to do. And that's what they did. So in a way, that was the case. Now, I therefore, as a child, um, uh, ha some of my best friends, really, <laughs> joking aside, they really were Jews. And we got on perfectly well. I don't remember uh, the, the parents of my uh, uh, friends, school friends, um, having any kind of feeling against me. But... The other kind of society I make, came across in London was not quite like that. That is what I would call English society, where I did feel um, that I was um, not up to scratch, not one of them. Um, and that's amongst people who were what I would call very English. They patronized me. They, were, they felt sorry for me, but I was definitely not one of them. And I, my, my old mother never learned English. She never learned English. It was her, her way of rejecting what had been done to Palestinians. She, she very much resented coming to this country. She made my father know it very well. Uh, and he would say to her, poor man, you know, look, I had to get work. And she would say, you could have got work in the Arab world. Why do you have to have to the very country which sold us down the river and, you know, things like that. And I respected her for that. She refused to learn the language of the oppressor. And now, how did I become an activist? Well, I think the earliest stirrings of that were the Suez Crisis. I, I, was, I was at school, and of course there were these Jewish girls in my class, and suddenly uh, we became on opposite sides. They were anti-Nasser, very anti-Arab, and I noticed that I despite my experiences living in a London suburb, I felt that I was actually Arab. Of course I was on Nasser's side, and I was very angry at these Jewish girls. And there was an incident where they got together and um, uh, were very, very unpleasant to me. And I, in fact, I lashed out and I beat this girl in my class. I hit her. Uh, she was, uh, you know, one of the, she was the ringleader. Anyway, however, that, that I would say was the earliest stirrings. 1967 did it. It really did it for me. I think it did it for a lot of people like me. These are memories I will never forget because in what we call the doctor's mess, I remember the television and people watching and looking and, and cheering the Israelis on. Uh, during that war, and I remember thinking, well, 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 who am I then? You know, I'm certainly not on their side. Um, you know, I'm on the other side. It was a, a, a real wake-up call from a sort of comfortable niche I'd got myself into, uh, which is that I was a doctor, I was working to advance my career, I, was, I fitted into English society, I had lots of English friends. I was married to an Englishman. Um, and so very, I was very much part of all of that. Suddenly, I was not part of all of that. I was different. And I was on the side of the, of the Arabs in this. And I was not on the side of Israel. And I was dismayed at all these friends I had, who were obviously totally insensitive. They had no feeling that I wouldn't share their views. They made no secret. They 
flapped for Israel and so on. And uh, it took, of course, from that shock, it took, I would say, a, a few a short, a few years to absorb what that meant to face who I was. Uh, I was not English. I'm Palestinian, and I will always be Palestinian, and I am not on the side of the people who back the usurper, the, the, the criminal that had taken our country, and, and that was it. So from, I would say, maybe 1969, uh, 1970, I really became an activist. And the earliest thing I did was to set up a charity, a British Palestinian charity um, registered in this country to help uh, Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. <clears throat> and uh, not long after that, 1972, I um, set up an organization called Palestine Action, not the Palestine Action today. This was the original Palestine Action, which I and a, and a few friends set up in the early 1970s. And the aim of Palestine Action was to inform, educate uh, the British public uh, about Palestine. And we did all the things that activists do. We had demonstrations, we wrote to important people. In 1973, I think, we, we had a, 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 an event which, as far as I know, um, was certainly unique at the time and, and since. Um, I got together a, a group of Palestinian women. We um, arranged a a, a sort of a somber walk down Whitehall, Whitehall towards the Cenotaph where we laid a wreath uh, for the lives of Palestinians who had been killed fighting with the British army in the war. And, and all these things were really pioneering at the time. We're talking about 1970s. We were only a few, really. We were only a few people. We were utterly dedicated. In terms of what it did for me, or to me, I was totally committed, of course, to Palestine. That I couldn't believe that I'd spent all those early years in, in England um, floating in some kind of void, uh, you know, and thinking that I, things were okay uh, when they were not okay. And that uh, uh, I had come from a Palestinian family, I had a very particular history, and I had a cause. And I would fight for that cause, which I knew was utterly just. No question about it. No nuances. It was 100% just and right, and uh, was really the cause of my life. When, when we set up Palestine Action and, and were working with it, through it, we didn't have any sense of other activist movements for other causes other than, other than uh, anti-colonialist uh, movements. Um, you know the, the 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 usual kind of thing. We had a we had an awareness. We had a, um, a, a solidarity with uh, with Cuba, with uh, Nicaragua, with other spots in the world where there were these ongoing struggles against imperial powers. I would say we were so consumed by the idea that Palestine had no backers, nobody defended Palestine. It was up to us to do it. We were consumed by this thought. So we didn't, and I think we didn't have the sophistication, frankly, the political sophistication or experience to understand that solidarity with other supportive groups was the way forward. We didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs>
Over many years of activism um, and political thinking, political writing, I came to the conclusion that there was only one way forward that would solve the, the tragedy of Palestine and only one way really of getting back our homeland and that was to acknowledge that there was and is a Jewish Israeli community uh, whether we like it or not and that the future, the only future, lies in uh, us Palestinians living together with this Israeli Jewish community in one state. It became very clear to me that that was the only way forward. Any other ideas were uh, unjust, uh, unfair, and didn't do it. We need to get back our homeland, all of it. Not two states, not 1967, not really any of those. <clears throat> now, the question then became, how do you do it? Because one of the things that is very noticeable about um, all the political work around Israel-Palestine is the unwillingness, I think, of commentators, analysts and so on to look very hard at how things get done. Fine, you can look at an aim and you can analyze what that should be and you can defend it and um, you can uh, oppose other points of view and so on. But you're always left with the question in the end is how, how do you get it done? If there's something you really believe in, how do you do it? Now, there's never been an answer, from what I can see, from all the reams that have been written about this conflict, never been an answer, um, uh, in the sense of something practical that would actually make it happen, that's what I mean. And most notoriously, the two-state solution. There's, everybody keeps talking about this, and look at the facts. Nobody will say to you, how can you make the two-state solution happen, for example. Now, how much more so is that the case for the one state, which I'm talking about? And I really spent a lot of time thinking about that. Um, uh, it finally came to me that there really is only one way to get at it. Um, and, and that is uh, for there to be a campaign not for two states, and not for a Palestinian state, but for equal rights in the land of what is called now Israel and is in fact the old Palestine. Um, today, I think people looking at the facts now, we're not talking about theory, we're looking at the facts. The facts on the ground are that Israel is ruling all the territory between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. That's one territory as far as Israeli rule is concerned. Now that territory, again we're looking at the facts, that territory is divided currently into, uh, by, by, in two populations. Um, one population is Jewish and uh, the other population is non-Jewish, uh, actually Palestinian. Now, if you look at the numbers, you observe that there is rough parity between these two groups. They're about 50-50. Um, and they've got one ruler, and that is Israel. Well, it's obvious to me that the way forward from this fact is to say, fine, okay, you, Israel, are the ruler. However, we, the non-Jews, have no rights at all. The Jews that you are ruling have rights. They have citizenship and they have rights. We, non-Jews, have no citizenship and no rights. Well, how can that be? Uh, so, this is, the, this, is the, this is the reality now. So where do we go from this? We say, okay, you're the ruler, but we want rights. We want rights. And the shortest way and the most direct way is to demand citizenship. 
That's what one would do in any other situation. So, right, citizenship. Now then, this is the idea which says that the Palestinians start a big campaign for equal rights, rather like South Africa, uh, but in this situation they are asking for uh, right uh, citizenship of the situation that exists. Now I don't say this lightly and I know that the idea that I have put forward has been studiously ignored by fellow Palestinians and by other commentators because it looks unworkable on the face of it. The question would be how on earth can you as the member of a, a dis, an uninfra, disenfranchised people who have suffered so much from Jewish Israelis, how can you ask that you become a citizen of the same state uh, that, that these people are living in and that they rule. How could you do that? It's, it's, it's unpalatable. What does it do to years of resistance against Israel? Um, you know, the, the answer for me is that one has to lay aside emotion, really, and use one's common sense. Because if one were to, let us imagine that one were to attain citizenship of the State of Israel as non-Jews. Imagine what that does to Zionism. That's the end of Zionism. That's for a start. And that uh, brings to the new citizens, the new citizens, the whole uh, of the homeland, all of it, at one stroke. Now, of course, we know that if that were to happen, that would solve the problem. That would so that's the end. That's the end of the Israeli state as a Zionist state I'm talking about. And so therefore that's the way forward. But we know very well that Israel will fight tooth and nail and so will its supporters against this eventuality from happening. Now you see, for me, the discussion needs to go there. Not to say, oh no, we can't do that, it's out of the question because it, because it goes against the tradition, which I understand, which I fully understand. But really, really, we're talking about the nitty-gritty of this. And the nitty-gritty is that this is the situation we have. We want to ask ourselves, how do we get out of this situation? And I say this in full knowledge that there are a number of uh, really praiseworthy uh, one-state groups working very hard both in Israel uh, and, and outside for the aim of one state, to create a one democratic state in place of the current situation. I know that, I support them, I commend them. But how long will it take? How long will it be before these movements grow into something very big, then they attract the attention of the powers that be, then we start to get a whole new transformation? I believe that that would be far too long for the ruined lives of Palestinians to go on being ruined. And therefore, the idea that I have put forward is one where at least we could try, we could try this. And uh, not only could we try this, but, but let us follow it through. Uh, supposing there were to be a massive campaign on the part of the Palestinians to say we demand equal rights, and that includes political rights, which of course implies citizenship. We demand that. The first thing that would happen is that nobody in the world can, other than Zionists, can um, not understand that. They understand that. They know it from South Africa, from the civil rights movement in the United States, everywhere. It's, it's something which is very obvious. Equal rights, right? So the first thing is, it's a campaign which is likely to attract support. Uh, the second thing that, that could, could result, which is that Israel, Israel then responds with alarm and um, increases the oppression of the Palestinians, shuts them up, imprisons them, does all the stuff it's doing already. Um, that, to my mind, you see, if you've got a proper 
PR campaign explaining to people why this is why this is happening, what's happening, that shows up Israel more clearly than anything else can do to show it up to be the brute that it really is. I can't see what's wrong with doing that. Um, and now you've got a big fight, which is for this very um, just and equitable aim of saying we want our rights, we want equal rights with the Jews. Nobody's throwing anybody out. We're not shooting, killing people. Peaceably, we're saying, please give us rights. I can't see how that... that uh, how, how, that, how that would not be a proper way forward. I think that what we're seeing today in the real um, Palestine of today, in the occupied territories, points to the future. When the uprisings that took place, sparked off by the evictions in Sheikh Jarrah, in the neighborhood in Jerusalem, where Palestinian families were about to be evicted, the uprisings that took place there were very, very important. They are really a landmark moment, because at that time there was a unity of purpose between the various different Palestinian communities under Israel's rule the Palestinians in Jerusalem, the ones uh, living in 1948 Israel, uh, the Palestinians in, in the West Bank, in Gaza, and the Palestinians outside, people like me. All of us were united at the time in opposing Israeli injustice and oppression. Now, Israel was able to um, subjugate the uprising at the time. However, it never really went. And therefore, I am very encouraged by this year, this May, the continuation or the what appears to be the new groups, but I think there really were ones that had come into being. And so now we've got groups of fighters um, in certain hotspots in um, the West Bank, in uh, Nablus, in Jenin, uh, in all the areas around uh, uh, Ramallah, uh, and of course in Gaza where we have Hamas. Now, these, these new, what look to be newish groups, these are young people, they are very clear, they need, they want Israel out, they want to end the oppression of Palestinians, uh, but at the same time, they're also uh, not in favor of the Palestinian Authority. Now that is new. To say, you, the Palestinian Authority, you are holding us back. We've, it's bad enough with Israel, but why do we have to have oppression from our own people? Now this is very interesting and I think is a, a pointer to the future. I don't think it will die down. The Israelis of course are doing their best to stamp it out and they will do that because that's what they do. Uh, but things have gone too far, I feel. And the way forward will be through these groups catching on, being in contact with each other, and there is evidence of that already. And um, so the really, how can I put this, the end of this Israeli state will come about in a very bloody, nasty, violent manner. What a tragedy. This experiment, the Zionist experiment, which worked or seemed to work in 1948, will have run for 75 years, maybe plus a bit more, for what? So that in the end, the whole thing will collapse, which is what I predict, in bloodshed, in violence, and in a return to something more civilized, humane, where people can actually live together and don't fight and kill and steal in order to impose their own reality. Um, of course, we're talking about something into the future, which I can't predict, 
but I think there are intimations of this and uh, I'm not really surprised that Israelis are alarmed. Um, the anti-Semitism which hunts everywhere, the silencing of the Palestinian voice, anything, you know, to shut people up so that this oppressive state can continue to oppress. Well, it's not going to work.